A reading from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will no, not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments will keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of this life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. amen. This prayer may be familiar to some of you from the Book of Common Prayer. It's called the Collect for Guidance, and it's one of the four prayers that are given as an option for daily use in our service of morning prayer. If you've ever done morning prayer with any regularity, you may know how these prayers that we hear again and again work their way into you. In you, we live and move and have our being. This phrase that begins the collect is one of those combinations of words that kind of stick in your mind and in your heart, making its way into your speech when you least expect it. This is one of those phrases priests say. It immediately invites us into the mystery of the Christian life. It points to a cosmic God so expansive that it encompasses all of reality, so large that our whole lives take place within that God, so broad that everything we see and hear and touch is within that God. This phrase seems like it must have been written by some famous poet, by Walt Whitman or Robert Frost or maybe Shakespeare, or maybe it's the work of the famously poetic translator of the King James Bible. It's compelling history as poetry goes back further than that, however. The phrase enters our Christian life through the Apostle Paul's speech here in Acts, but it had an even earlier origin, a quotation from the Greek poet Erastus, addressed in a poem to the Greek god Zeus. It names something so deep that it transcends religious boundaries. So when Paul stands on the Areopagus, the rocky outcropping across from the Parthenon in Athens, a place that you can still visit today, or could until March, when Paul stands and looks upon the altar dedicated to the, quote, unknown God, Paul is drawing on a deep element of tradition for the Athenians, an intuitive understanding that the people had about the movement of God in the world, an intuitive understanding about the mystery of the movement of God in the world. Mystery is something that we are generally uncomfortable with as modern people. We are much more comfortable with things that are either known or things that are fully unknown, puzzles to be solved. But the mystery of the movement of God in the world is not a puzzle to be solved. It's something that we will never fully grasp, just as we will never fully grasp the world around us. As smart modern people, we like to think that we have a grasp on the world. We build roads and bridges, we fly airplanes, we build satellites and sequence DNA. There's a lot that we already know. And there is a lot that we can control. Whether by intelligence or merely pers persistence, 
There is no doubt that we human beings leave our mark. Even so, however, the natural world that surrounds us is always just a little beyond our control. There's always slightly more ajuga growing up around the edges of our garden beds, always more turtles waiting to snap up goslings, always a robin chick lying on the pavement with no nest in sight, always a muskrat making his home in our drainage pipe and undermining our dam. We live and move and have our being in a natural world that surpasses our comprehension, if only in its sheer level of detail. Beginning with our own lives, in our own kitchens, in our own living rooms, and then zooming out like an aerial photographer, we see our home and our neighborhood. We see our street and our town. We see a bird's eye view of Cold Spring Harbor, of Laurel Hollow, Lloyd Harbor, Huntington, the North Shore, Long Island, and New York. Each place is full of homes and people. An unimaginable level of detail comes into view as we shift our perspective outward. The same is true, however, though, when we zoom in rather than zoom out. Yesterday, I was digging in the earth in this garden, planting a few rows of late spring beets. I turned over a bit of soil and I saw several pill bugs, a millipede, a worm, and a tiny slug, all disrupted by my digging. A microcosm of a neighborhood here in a square foot of soil. The soil of our garden is the ground of their being the bugs working their way into the soil, like the prayers of the daily office work their way into our vocabulary and in our hearts. In you, we live and move and have our being. This week, I lost a mentor of mine to brain cancer, and I was texting with a friend about everything that Diane had taught me when suddenly snow began to fall on the spring flowers outside my window. Absurd as it is, it's hard for me not to imagine that there was something there for me in snowflakes on azaleas. A mysterious message from the God who's all around. The mystery isn't so much about things that are unknowable individually, but about things that are unknowable collectively. Because who has time to know each slug and each millipede to know why there was snow on a May day? Who has the ability to name each baby robin and each gosling before they disappear? But we know who has the time. Our God. Our God who is always in some way unknown and unknowable, but who knows not only the muskrat's name, but ours as well. This whole season of Easter is about explaining that mystery. The mystery of how God, the living God, dwells in us, and we in God, often without our knowing it. There's always so much to learn about this God who is fundamentally beyond our knowing. In Acts, Paul reminds us that since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. Instead, we are invited into a continually unfolding relationship with a God who is all around us. Today's gospel continues to follow this thread. Jesus speaks in the gospel of John saying, I will ask the Father and he will send you another advocate to be with you forever. Advocate is capitalized here because it's the Greek word paraclete, the word used to name the Holy Spirit. The paraclete, the advocate, can be recognized because it abides with us and is in us. This is the Spirit of God that swept over the face of the universe at the beginning. This is the Spirit of God that is with us today, here in the garden, here at the pond, here in your home, in front of your television or laptop or phone, 
here in your yard, maybe by your porch or in your azaleas, maybe by your front door and the sidewalk you step out onto. The Spirit of God who guides us and the Spirit of God who knows our name. God knows our name and calls out to us with every element in the world that surrounds us. But this call often goes unheard. Last week, Gideon spoke to us from his red prayer chair about the work of listening to God. He challenged us during this period of distancing to consider not just theoretically, how do you make space for God, to listen to God in your life, but literally, how do you make space to listen to God in your life? Where and when and how? What are the practices that you use to cultivate your attention to the Spirit's presence with you every moment? The Father will send the Advocate, but it is our choice to follow. It's on us to pay attention. It's on us to pattern our lives in the way of Jesus. As we stand here in the Grow to Give garden, looking across the pond at the church, we are a lot like Paul looking across at the Parthenon. We ask the question, where is the God? And the Spirit answers, I am right here. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of this life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. In the faithfulness to the divine bonds between us, we bring what we have to one another. As we also remember our neighbors near and far, Though God has created us equally, the world does not treat us so. Until wrongs are made right, let us be generous in sharing our goods and furthering the spirit of justice. So let us present the offering of our life and labor unto the Lord. Amen. <laughs>